We've been doing these hybrid mods on NVIDIA cards since the GTX 1080 launch, later with the 1080 Ti. We've done work with the 980 Ti hybrid actual cards from EVGA. And generally, the takeaway has been that reducing the thermal headroom limitations, often created by the reference coolers, even these, the non-blower ones, reducing those limitations significantly improved the clock boosting headroom, which enabled greater performance. And a lot of the add-in board partner models that do better than reference, it's because they are better cooled, not necessarily because they're pre-overclocked. So today we are doing that again with the 2080 Ti. That says 2080. We're doing it with the 2080 Ti. There are a lot of cards and pieces right now. And seeing what, what the limitation is, because it's probably going to be power this time, because NVIDIA has changed things quite a bit for this generation. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's RTX 2080 Ti XE Ultra video card. We recently used this to beat our Founders Edition overclocking results with its additional power target headroom and cooling capabilities. The XE Ultra uses a 2.7 extra thick heat sink for quiet operation under low loads, but also maintains higher clocks on average over the FE model. Learn more at the link in the description below. So we stuck a Be Quiet 280 CLC on there, and we used fans for airflow over the VRM and VRAM. You actually don't need any kind of heat sink on the VRM or the memory modules on these cards in a test bench where you can blast thousands of RPM worth of air at the bare modules. In a case, you should probably have a heat sinks or fin stacks or something uh, because it does get quite hot, actually. We found that the memory tested, and this chart won't be in here, but tested just bare with no fans on it at all. Just just a, a liquid cooler on the GPU and nothing on the memory or the VRM. Found that the memory was hitting about 90C, which is about spec. So obviously we added some fans after that. We stuck uh, two on there for the most part, one on the top exhausting, one on uh, front angle intake blasting straight into all the hot components, and then we had some airflow from the CLC that was attached to the card as well. Testing today, the primary focus is going to be on thermal performance versus frequency performance. So we're using 3D Mark and Firmark for that. And then we also have some game benchmarks to see if lifting the thermal limitation gives us any additional boosting headroom that actually benefits us in games. Typically, the answer is, is worth doing because typically we get anywhere from 5 to even upwards of 9% in a couple of our past tests with either Vega or the Pascal series cards. And so that's worth doing a hybrid mod. But it's a lot different these days because we're power limited to about 15 amps down the PCIe cables. Starting strictly with frequency will help best illustrate the performance characteristics of our hybrid mod. We'll get to thermals momentarily, but first, for this test, we're using 3D Mark Firestrike Extreme on a frozen frame to render the same data repeatedly. With both cards that left completely stock, aside from the cooling differences, we noted that the hybrid card was able to sustain clocks of around 1920 to 1935 megahertz with a flat line, more or less, from start to finish, plus or minus 15. The fact that there is no immediate drop-off at the start of the test illustrates that there's frequency benefit from a cooler core. The stock card, meanwhile, air-cooled, experienced frequency decay from 1940 megahertz down to around 1775 MHz, where it sat for the rest of the test. The total difference in clocks is about 160 megahertz, which may as well be an overclock at this point. That's a lot of frequency loss to thermals, and NVIDIA steps its frequency curve based upon temperature, starting as low as the 40s or 50s Celsius, and scaling up to 63 degrees, 79 degrees, 84 degrees, 87 degrees, and so on, where you drop some frequency each step of the way. Better coolers will sustain higher clocks. It doesn't have to be a liquid cooler either, but it would be tough to beat the GPU core thermals that we managed here. We'll look at those in a moment. Before the thermals though, here's what it looks like when we add an overclocked line to the chart. We were able to sustain a highly stable 2130 MHz clock once we found stability. You'll see a few crashes in there from when we were finding the limits. The all-time peak was 2175 MHz, and then we stabilized for a little while at 2145, but the application crashed shortly thereafter. A firm, stable frequency of 2130 MHz was possible in Firestrike with the new cooling solution. That's a major jump over the air-cooled card, but whether or not it gets leveraged in games will heavily lean on when the power limits are encountered. Let's look next at the same test as the previous two charts, except this time from the perspective of thermal results on the GPU die only. 
We can look at VRM and VRAM temperatures next. Note that for this chart, we heavily controlled ambient temperature and monitored it every second. Data is presented with a constant ambient temperature. The air-cooled card sits at a near constant 75 degrees Celsius, plus or minus 2 degrees. The hybrid managed a 42 degree constant temperature with occasional fluctuations, also plus or minus 2 C. The overclocked variant pushed to 45 degrees but stopped there and is very impressive in its thermal positioning. And for individual component temperatures on the next chart, we saw the GBU core drop to 18 degrees delta T over ambient. Again, that is over ambient, which was about 22 degrees Celsius during this testing. The VRM temperature averaged for our hybrid mod in Fermark was 60.8 degrees over ambient, with the memory temperature at 40.8 degrees also over ambient. These temperatures were achieved entirely with just a ton of air cooling. We had two fans pointed directly at the VRM and VRAM during this test, illustrating that heat sinks are actually not necessary with sufficient airflow. We'd still advise heat sinks, especially inside of a case, but they're not wholly necessary in the right environment. The stock air-cooled card averaged a 52 degree over ambient core temperature and 50 degree VRM temperature, also over ambient, with memory at 58 degrees Celsius, over ambient. F1 2018 is up now. This game uses Codemaster's Ego engine and is useful for a heavily GPU-intensive title. It's also our only racing game representation. At 4K, the hybrid mod pushed 102 FPS average, managing a lead barely outside of error margins when put against the air-cooled Founders Edition. The difference is about 3%. It's entirely limited by power at this point. We're pegged to 15 amps down the PCIe cables for both the air-cooled and liquid-cooled versions of the card. Overclocking gives us some extra room, but results in a tie with the air-cooled overclock. This limitation is resultant of power limitations again. We can only really circumvent that with shunt mods or something similar at this point, like higher end board partner cards with a bigger power limit, but Nvidia still restricts that to some extent. Just in case you were wondering, 1440p is the same situation. The hybrid mod pushes about 4% faster frame rate than the 2080 Ti FE, not impressive for the amount of work involved, and ultimately a power limitation. Once again, we're stuck at 15 amps down the PCIe cables, not counting what's drawn through the PCIe slot. We recently praised Sniper Elite 4 for its impressive scalability from the team's in-house Asura engine and proper DX12 implementation. Unfortunately, it also posts zero meaningful scaling, showing hard power limits and killing all hope for thermal differences triggering meaningful clock boosts that actually impact performance. Far Cry 5 is next. This one uses the Dunya engine and is commonly GPU bottlenecked, particularly at higher resolutions. The game is also running a representation of a DX11 title. At 4K, the RTX 2080 Ti FE operates at 74 FPS average, with the hybrid mod at 76 FPS average. We see zero scaling when both are overclocked to plus 200 MHz core and plus 850 memory. The scaling has vanished as we've bumped against a hard power limitation. 1440p posts the same thing. We're hitting power limits more than thermal limits, despite the stock hybrid card outperforming the stock air-cooled card by 2.7%. Overclocking both ends up fully limited by power. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is the last one we'll bother showing. This is a modified Crystal Engine game on DX12. We have other games benchmarked as well, like GTA and Ashes, but results scaling is identical between these and all of the others. It'd be boring to show 20 minutes of charts that are power limited, Suffice to say, the hybrid mod only helps marginally for this generation's reference card. We simply need more power. As for Tomb Raider, though, at 4K, the numbers are nearly identical for both stock hybrid and air-cooled cards and the overclocked variants alike. No meaningful change from thermal advantage here. So there's your answer. Completely not worth it. Even a water block. For everyone who is like, well, why not just use a water block? Well. That wouldn't matter either, because the temperature is going to be about the same. In fact, the temperature for what we did is probably lower, because we're not sinking the heat of the VRM and VRAM as well. It's just the GPU. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what block you use, because, uh, I mean, if you're just going for silence, that's one thing. But if you're going for maximum overclocking headroom, it's irrelevant. There's a massive power limitation, which is interesting, because the PCB that goes to these cards, the TI especially, it's the best PCB that NVIDIA has done on a consumer card that I can remember. It can take a lot of power. They've capped it uh, where it at. It doesn't need to be capped where it is, the PCB. The VRM can take it. 
the GPU can take it. So we're not exactly sure why they did it. Perhaps uh, maybe the GPU does start to have problems in terms of longevity. We don't know exactly how the process ages or how, the, how this particular uh, GPU and architecture ages under different thermal and voltage conditions, but the VRM for sure can handle it. And it just as overclockers, even if it kills the card, we'd like to have the ability to push more power into it anyway. But that's kind of beside the point. So yeah, not worth it. Uh, water block, if you're doing it because you know you like water cooling or you like the silence that liquid provides, sure, those are completely valid reasons. But it's not really a great idea to do liquid cooling specifically to get additional overclocking or, or boosting headroom because you're not going to get any. So not worth it there. The biggest limitation is power. There are reference PCBs from EVGA, like the XE Ultra, that have a, a vBIOS version that lets you get an extra 7% power or so, but that's not that much. And liquid cooling, it's not going to get you anything really significantly better anyway. Now, there are thermal steps for frequency at something like uh, the, there's one at 63 degrees, one at 79, 83, or 4, uh, 87, and so forth. So lower temperature does help a bit, but just not enough, because you're constantly hitting the power limitation all the time. So biggest problem here is power limit. Not 100% sure why NVIDIA said it where they did. We'll, we'll try and ask them and maybe find out. Uh, most likely their excuse is that it's probably for longevity of the card, maybe for health of the die, something like that, which would be valid if, if true. We just don't have a good way to validate that. And finally, if you do have a custom board, and we have some, like the ASUS ones, we got MSIs in, we have some others. So if you have custom boards that allow more power throughput, then yeah, those would be better liquid cooling candidates, but the coolers on those are already pretty good anyway. So we'll be looking at those more in the future, but the next thing to do with the hybrid card that we built is probably just short the shunts and see if shorting the shunt resistor just gets us any additional uh, power headroom. It should, but probably not a lot. So that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Helps out directly. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a mod mat like this one, one of our shirts, or one of our teardown crystals like we have back here. And I'll see you all next time.